Off the western coast of Canada lies a marine universe unlike any other on the face of our planet. A dark world inhabited by an extraordinary variety of life forms and governed by laws that are unknown in other seas. Here, the dim and icy waters of the ocean are tormented by the most powerful currents of North America and their secrets are still largely unexplored. This is the home of the terrifying tentacled monster of ancient legends and myths. Octopus Dofleini, the giant octopus of the Pacific. South of Alaska, the Pacific coast is bordered by the high mountains of British Columbia. Along the shores of Vancouver Island, the icy runoff from inland glaciers mingles with powerful currents from the ocean in a lacy network of fjords, estuaries and canals. The sounds, long, river-like inlets of the ocean, seem calm enough on the surface. But when the tides change, the mighty currents provoke raging storms beneath their gentle waves. Mike Richmond was once a legendary octopus hunter. Years ago, Mike guided an expedition led by Jacques Cousteau that extended the fame of these uncontaminated waters far beyond the Canadian borders. We're sailing northward through the Strait of Georgia. In a small inlet on the shores of Quadra Island lies an ideal habitat for the giant octopus that Mike calls Octopus City. The water here is only a few degrees above zero, even at the height of summer. Mike and his assistant, Todd, don special dry suits of neoprene and strong plastic fibers that protect their bodies from the biting cold. Their heavy belts weigh over 50 pounds. Everything's ready, but our descent has to be timed with the utmost precision. We are waiting for slack water, that brief interval of calm just before the tides turn and the raging currents reverse their course. The diver who challenges these running currents runs a fatal risk of being swept off course. The captain is in constant contact with the Coast Guard, checking the tide tables. When the time is right, he gives us the go-ahead. Rock and roll. The murky water is filled with swirling clouds of river sediment, and during the summer months, the visibility is even further reduced by the dense swarms of drifting plankton. As we descend, 
the light of the sun becomes a distant memory. In these dark, greenish waters, our eyes and ears are of little use. The sea bottom becomes our only point of reference. Our arrival is immediately noted by a rather menacing band of dogfish. Outside the path of the currents, we find clearer waters. A lonely rock is the home of an octopus dauphleni. It's hardly the giant we've been looking for. In the 1960s, when these waters were first being explored, Octopus hunts were organized, contests in which men pitted their skills against colossal creatures armed with tentacles that were 12 to 15 feet long. Like the common octopus, this young Dofleini glides through the silent waters propelled by jets of water from its siphon. A dense cloud of ink conceals its departure. Its skin is a palette of changing colors. All octopuses display a surprising ability to adapt to their environments. Their vision is excellent and they're considered to be the most intelligent of all the marine invertebrates. The giant octopus is particularly skilled at wrinkling its mantle. This increases the surface area of its sensitive skin, transforming its body into a complex network of antennas for exploring its surroundings. No one knows how large these cephalopods can grow. In 1957, an enormous specimen weighing 272 kilograms was found on the western shores of Canada. Its tentacles were over nine meters long. We head for deeper waters, winding our way through a thick undersea jungle. This watery green world is teeming with unexpected wonders. Just where the churning currents are strongest, there's an astounding profusion of life. Anchored to the submerged cliffs are flower-like animals that eat and breathe with the same ease, filtering the icy waters rich in nutrients. White plumose anemones adorn this magnificent gallery like a fluffy blanket of freshly fallen snow. In the gloomy light that penetrates these depths, the beauty of this submerged kingdom is completely lost on its inhabitants. What can be the purpose of a breathtaking landscape like this, its wonders almost completely veiled in darkness? To our eyes, these marine creatures appear fragile and incredibly delicate. But for many of their neighbors, these candid arms represent a deadly risk. 
tiny heart clam escapes the fatal embrace of a sea star only to fall into the paralyzing clutch of an anemone. The octopus isn't the only sea creature with an excess of arms. The petal-like appendages of this sunflower starfish, one of the largest species in the world, make the octopus look like a simple four-leaf clover. Our shy little friend's mantle takes on the colors of the ocean floor. An animal this size would have a tough time making a snack of one of the huge king crabs prowling about on these underwater shelves. The young crabs, whose shells are still soft, band together in small groups to protect themselves against predators. During the day, the octopus rarely wanders far from its den. There are too many unsavory characters out there waiting. Killer whales, seals, dolphins, sharks. Even a large cod can be a threat. It much prefers to explore its realm under the cover of darkness. Despite its rather monstrous appearance, the wolf eel is completely harmless. The pale-skinned male and his chocolate-colored mate form a faithful couple that remains together for life. Mating occurs once a year. The wolf eel is one of the few fish capable of devouring a sea urchin. At slack tide, when the currents are at rest, its meal begins. Cods follow the hunter's progress closely. Kelp greenlings like nothing better than tidying up the leftovers from the wolf eel's banquet. In shallower waters, at the edges of the kelp forests, there's a complex marine community. It's as vast and varied as that of the tropical rainforests and the coral reefs. The kelp plant begins life as a microscopic spore, which gives rise to graceful banner-like fronds that can extend for up to 60 meters. At their bases are immense colonies of prickly sea urchins. These living pincushions consider the tender kelp fronds a true delicacy. Despite their impressive suits of armor, the sea urchins aren't immune to attacks. A starfish lends a hand to a hungry group of kelp greenlings. It's an odd but effective alliance.
Like many fish that live along these cliffs, the wolf eel isn't a strong swimmer. As slack tide ends, he heads for his den. The powerful currents could easily drag him away from his territory. The male initiates a rather complicated U-turn to take up his post inside the rocky home. His mate is close behind. The sea is about to be transformed into a raging river. It's time for a break. We sighted six small octopuses, including one destined for the lab of the Vancouver Aquarium. The Canadian divers can't hide their disappointment. The apparent absence of the Pacific giant is an ominous sign. Hey, we are here. For centuries, Indian legends and seafarers' tales teemed with tentacled giants, and the increasing rarity of this species, especially the larger members, is clear evidence of man's growing interference in these waters. For years, the octopus was mercilessly hunted for its meat, which was also used as bait on the deep-sea fishing boats. Our journey resumes towards the Octopus Islands. The name sounds promising. Our fascination and respect for the creatures that populate these waters is by no means a modern day phenomenon. The Indians that lived along these breathtaking coasts thousands of years ago looked upon all the sea dwellers as their friends. 25 years ago, when Mike guided the Cousteau expedition, the French explorer compared the richness of this underwater world to that of the Red Sea. As summer ends, salmon congregate along the coasts of Alaska and British Columbia, preparing for the grueling upriver journey to their spawning grounds. These estuaries are the favorite hunting grounds of the killer whale. As evening falls, the dogfish becomes even more daring. Suddenly, a ship appears before us on the ocean floor. The SS British Columbia was purposely sunk offshore to provide housing and defensive refuges for fish and other sea dwellers. The command cabin looks like a perfect abode for a giant octopus. But once again, our search is in vain. We wind our way northward through the fjords and channels that separate Vancouver Island from the mainland. The arrival of the salmon 
is eagerly awaited by the seal colonies. Resting on a floating log bank, which rises and falls with the tides, eliminates their constant search for dry land. When the moon is full, the tide here can rise almost six meters. The same strategy has been used by the seal's human neighbors in Whale Town. Where logs are scarce, every available rock is quickly occupied. A hungry seal pup struggles in the waves. His mother and her warm milk are waiting on shore. The other members of the colony watch anxiously. After several failed attempts, he glides ashore on the shoulders of the surf. The rise and fall of the tides has an enormous effect on most of the animals living along the coast. The sparkling tide pools are microcosms of marine life stranded on the rocky coast. As the tide advances, the open sea returns to bathe the sun-baked rocks and the creatures that it left behind. Above and below the surface, seabirds replenish their stores of mollusks, shellfish, and insects. Thanks to their large water reserves, the brightly painted sea stars can relax while they wait for the ocean's return. For the smaller starfish, the main threat is the hungry seagulls. We've made over 90 dives, and the largest octopus we've seen measured little more than a meter. Our spirits are at rock bottom. Suddenly, our assistant Federica suggests a visit to the band of fat black seals basking in the sun near the boat. She quickly dons one of our dry suits and wades out into the icy water. The seals are specialized at hunting in the thick forests of kelp. At slack water, they weave in and out among the long fronds, hot on the heels of their prey. They're especially fond of the tender, succulent meat of the octopus. Federica spies a jumble of crab carcasses and shells piled in front of a rocky crevice. It's obviously the lair of an octopus, and the owner must be quite large to have survived in these seal-infested waters. In the pale rays of the early morning sun, we find ourselves face to face with the largest octopus ever filmed in the wild. The protagonist of countless legends and myths. Pliny the Elder describes an eight-armed monster that regularly left its home in the deep to visit the markets along the Mediterranean coast, wreaking panic among the town's inhabitants. The Greek legend 
tells of an octopus that was so enormous that an archbishop celebrated mass on its head, mistaking it for a rock. Victor Hugo recounted a vicious battle between a giant octopus and a man. Jules Verne imagined an army of tentacle giants that attempted to crush the Nautilus of Captain Nemo. The Giant Octopus of the Pacific. Far from the monster of legends, it's a fragile and gentle creature that willingly accepts our caresses, a silent ambassador from the world where life first appeared on our planet. Our friend's mild eyes sparkle with a keen understanding. Despite its extraordinary intelligence, it has never succeeded in colonizing the seas of our planet. Man's modern conquest of the oceans is threatening the survival of this species in its own kingdom, an uncontaminated sea where life depends on the rise and fall of the tides. <laughs>